once again, good friends. Brian from Apex Detail here. Harbor Freight has felt the need to swap out their 6-inch dual-action polisher from a Chicago Electric to a Bauer. Although there are some differences and they look the same, around the same weight, have the same shape, uh, both 8mm throws, there are quite a few differences and we are going to pinpoint them and look at them closely today. Let's get this started. The Bauer dual-action polisher can be picked up at Harbor Freight, $79. It is a 600 watt, 6400 OPM, comes with a 10 foot cord. Unboxing it, you'll pull out the polisher itself and a six inch backing plate. The wrench to take off the backing plate, I'll show you how to do that. These are the backing plates with the threaded inserts and the nylon washer ready to go. I also have a 5 inch and a 3 inch backing plate ready for demonstration purposes for later on. In the video we have the extra set of carbon brushes and the instruction manual. For the closer look segment of the video, the Bauer Polisher has the lock on slide switch. I never did like those. Any little bump kicks them right off. So you push forward, then you tilt forward and it's locked and you just tap it to get the switch to come back off. Six speed variable speed dial with no tactile feedback whatsoever. Uh, any little bump will move it from one speed to another. When it comes to the um, cord here, this is a 10 foot cord. It is junior service, however it is not a thermoplastic. It's more of, I can't get this thing to focus right, but is it's more of a rubber cord which is a little bit more pliable and a little nicer throwing it up over the shoulders. Midline, mid-range cord. Platypus handle up front here held on by this plastic screw. We have the metal shroud 6 inch backing plate this is the area where you're going to go in with your wrench to lock on and then remove the backing plate. The two position auxiliary handle can go, go in either side, of course. Depending on if you're a lefty or a righty. But I'll tell you one thing that I don't like these, but the one advantage this gives you, this polisher doesn't have a flat ridge to set the polisher down on the floor or on a table and have nice balance. It's going to fall right over onto the pad and you have to change pads. At least with the handle on one side or another, depending on if you're right-handed or left-handed, it can balance on something and keep that pad away from the floor or the ground. When it comes to changing backing plates, look at, we have to take this off for the look inside segment of the video anyway, so this insert here is where the wrench goes. Spin counterclockwise. And there you go. Again, that was a 5 inch. This is the 6 inch. You can also put on a 3 inch backing plate. Let's take a look at some of the dimensions. From the tip of the platypus handle to where the cord starts, we have a little over 1 foot. Overall width, 84 mils. Overall height from the top of the polisher down to the bottom of the metal shroud, 124.2 mil. Overall weight of the unit without the backing plate and pad, a little bit over 4 pounds. Not a heavy unit. We have the anti-static mat here with the polisher on it, so that means it's time for the look inside segment. We're going to remove the platypus uh, handle here. We're going to take off the shroud after removing the counterbalance. And we're going to get to the gearbox. We're going to get to the other end of the polisher, the brain's end. We're also going to take this off and take a look at the rotor, take a look at the windings and the coil. And uh, yeah, we're going to take a look at the bindings and everything the inside of this polisher has to offer. All you're going to need for this, Phillips head. Most of these screws are all Phillips head. You need a uh, regular for just one of these plastic screws on top. For the platypus handle, this plastic screw right here. Pull that right off, flip it over. Okay, this is the type of polisher where we pull the screws for the counterweight and remove the counterweight and you have 
three or four screws to remove the metal shroud. You actually have to get grab your Allen key with this round insert going through the top of the gear box there. It'll lock in eventually. Simply spin counterclockwise. And there you go. It's threaded, comes right off. And that reveals then three Phillips head screws to get rid of this metal shroud here. Pull that back out. Remove the three Phillips head screws. Pull that off. Just cast aluminum. Cast that to the side. Now, we see four Phillips head screws, and that will open up and reveal the spindle gear and the pinion gear. The one thing I see that I don't like already, the old uh, Chicago Electric had a plastic tab that had this um, bearing sealed here. This one here isn't sealed. The little pieces of dirt get in there easily and that causes premature wear and tear but let's remove this and get to the inside All right, with those removed, just carefully twist it back and forth, lift up, and that will reveal the spindle gear and pinion gear and the crappy factory grease that we're going to remove using Citral 266. Clean that junk out of there, and we'll get some Wolf's Head Red Lithium Grease, moisture-resistant, high temp, and we'll pack that nice and tight. All right, so the next thing we have to do is remove four more screws to get to the rotor and the motor. Before we remove these four, however, we do need to get to the other end and pull out the carbon brushes so we can successfully remove the motor and the rotor, separate them without damaging anything. So all that takes is one little Phillips head in this side of the plastic casing. And by the way, the casing is a GF30. That means 90% nylon. And just take it easy, wiggle it back and forth, slowly slide this back through the cord. Make sure there's no wires attached to the outside of the casing. And that will reveal the brass stamped carbon brush holders. And the one thing I do like to see is the spring clamps that are holding these in here. As the brush wears down, the spring pushes down on it and keeps feeding the carbon brush down into the rotor. So all we have to do is pull the top of that spring off the carbon brush. We'll pull it off out of the brass stamped holder. Unplug the wire right there. Pull those out on both sides. They're on opposite sides. Now we could safely remove that whole rotor out of there when we remove those screws and do not damage the unit. And you know, while we're down at this end of the polisher, let's take a look at the inside. This is the nylon arm that comes down to the 8 amp switch that turns the unit on. This is the speed dial. Again, I'm not very satisfied with the dial not having any tactile feedback whatsoever. Spins easily. And I don't know if you could see in here the old unit, the Chicago unit, had a coated PCB board, and this does not. Coated PCBs, it protects it from moisture and dust, and just is makes me feel a whole lot better when it's when it's in there. So everything else looks okay. The only thing I don't like, the crimp uh, spade connectors here don't have shrink wrap on them. That's a little sloppy. I like to see the shrimp shrink wrap. The wiring management looks okay. Here we have some shrink wrap. They just didn't put it everywhere. It's a little odd. I guess you need to spare a buck here and there, and that's what you need to do. Um, but everything else is standard in here. Okay, let's remove these uh, carbon brushes, and we'll get to pull the rotor out. 
So all we do is get your tool in here, lift, go to the side and let it go down, pull out the carbon brush. You don't even have to disconnect it from here. If you were swapping out the brushes, either, when they get worn down to right about here, this line, that's, that's when you're going to have to replace them anyway. But just pull it out, turn it over, repeat the process, pull out the brush, and now we can go back to the other side and remove these screws. Now we're just going to very carefully wiggle things back and forth and separate slowly. And here we go. This little plastic shield here came from this area right here, just like that. We're going to remove it anyways so we could take a look at the fuel wrap in the inside. The one thing I don't like about these units the top, the switch right here, as you're, sliding as you're sliding forward to lock it on, see how close that gets to the field winding? That I don't like. Uh, the field winding does have, it has been dipped in a resin that protects it. Not quite as much as some of the other units. Everything else looks clean in there. This isn't a CNC bearing, so it's not sealed. And that's something I don't like. Little pieces of dust and dirt can get in there, cause premature wear and tear. If you want to check out the video for the Chicago Electric Unit, you'll see that they do have indeed uh, sealed bearings. When it comes to the fan, uh, that's one upgrade I do like. It is a directional fan. See, as you can see, the, the blades are curved. This gives nice airflow down through the motor. The other one just had the straight fins which uh, I, I don't know the purpose of that. It uh, doesn't give optimal airflow through the unit to drop to keep temperatures cool. But uh, yeah, that's, that's a nice little, um, little, little loose in there. And you can see the uh, windings have been dipped in a resin. The only thing that I don't like that the other one has, when it comes to the commentator here, the other one had epoxy in this area. If you take notice, if you watch that video, that keeps everything wound nice and tight, and that will um, help with the vibration of the unit. We're going to get to the vibration in just a few seconds when we get to the next segment, but um, with the vibration this unit has, the epoxy around this area would have everything held nice and tight. And again, stop premature wear and tear. The laminations are all nice and tight and cleanly stamped here, so no problem there. So we have one small upgrade, but other than that, it's been a real disappointment on the inside of this unit. So we're going to get it together, and we'll go over the functionality of the unit, how, or, how it performs, and what it could be used for. With everything back together and buttoned up, Instead of putting the 5 or the 6 inch backing plate, let's put the 3 inch on here, see what that looks like. Get the threads started. Get your wrench on there, hold it, spin it clockwise, not really tighten it down, just nice and snug, and there you go. You can see, the polisher is just as wide as the backing plate and pad would be for Getting into tight areas, which wouldn't be too bad. This is, again, the power on, power off. Slide it forward. Let's take it down a notch here. Getting all excited there, big guy. Turning it on, slide it forward. Brings the arm forward, which in turn clicks the 8-amp switch to turn the motor on. And you just lock it in position. Let's go through the speeds here. One through six.
Now I got to tell you, this thing is extremely loud and there is a heck of a lot of vibration. Just to warn you guys, let's take it and work on a few panels. I could show you how it can be used. As a three inch polisher, it would be effective getting in tighter areas, curvy areas, areas that are hard to reach. Front bumper of this would be a perfect example. Time to remove the three inch backing plate, replace it with a five inch because on this vehicle right here we're working on removing an aged coating. Get it ready to replace it with a brand new coating. If not held perfectly flat or working up against an edge or a curvy area, you will find the unit stalls. The unit's probably best used for paint enhancements and maybe one steps. And for the final thought segment of the video, and this is going to be short because I cannot recommend this polisher to anyone. I love you guys. Catch you all in the next video.